What's up, Iron Investors? Welcome back to another epic episode, ICN Talks, your favorite crypto podcast, where you know that we aim to interview C-level executives, founders, visionary entrepreneurs. And for this reason, today we have a very special guest. I hope will be a very good uh, insight for you. Have uh, valuable uh, information about uh, real estate and not only. Thank you very much, Farouk Saeed. Welcome to ICN Talks. Thank you for having me, Danny. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here as a part of your podcast. Uh, we are uh, keen to discover your uh, story, successful one. We've been following you for uh, for a while and uh, we know that uh, you achieve such a great results in uh, Dubai ecosystem. So please, let's go to Genesis day one, how <laughs> everything started. The story goes back a while. I've lived in Dubai all my life. Uh, my parents came over here uh, in 1990, all right? And uh, since then, you know, uh, grew up over here, Dubai's home, um, graduated from uh, the American University, and uh, real estate is all I know. So straight out of university, actually during my university time as well, I was working within the real estate field. So I started my first job as an assistant at a real estate brokerage company right before I went into university. <laughs> so the summer before, after high school, my dad's like, what are you doing for three months? Go work for a real estate company. I just walked into an office where I, you know, helped around the owner a little bit and I learned a lot and it kind of sparked my interest at that age. And luckily I continued working throughout my university time as well. And then straight out of college, I was, uh, you know, deep into the real estate market. And um, Springfield's a family business. So luckily got into the family business and uh, we've grown from strength to strength since then. You had uh, the entire playground for you, <laughs> waiting for you to develop your skills. Oh yeah, definitely. It you know, was, it was uh, uh, almost like a um, no-brainer, right? Like uh, the decision was already made for you to, to join the real estate. So team. yes and no. So we had a few different businesses. So my dad had a car rental company that he was running from, you know, the early 90s in Dubai up until late 2010. 10, 2011. So that was the first option. Then we had a couple of restaurants. And then my dad started dabbling in real estate as an investor, not as a broker. Okay. So we started Springfield as a more like an investment company. So my father and a few friends were buying real estate. And then they said, you know what, let's open a brokerage company. So we weren't really running it as a proper brokerage company for the longest time. We just had the license and, you know, we did our own transactions. So it's only after I graduated, you know, I tried working restaurant business and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I I was so bad. You know, I just went out. I said, Dad, I can't do this. It's not that, me. This is not me. <laughs> yeah. Restaurants is not for me. Then he said, you know what, go out and get some professional experience. And I still remember right after, out of university, I went for... I think it was 12 or 13 interviews, you know, for different jobs at multinationals. And you know how many jobs I got? Zero. <laughs> I didn't get accepted in a single interview I did. I was so demotivated. You know, I just said, you know, there's something missing. Then I decided to do my MBA. I said, maybe I need to do my master's and probably after my master's, then I'll get a job. I need to level up my I, I have to level up more because that was the only excuse I found <laughs> yeah. for not getting a job. I said, you know what? Wherever I go, all my friends are getting jobs. I'm the only one who's not getting a job. Then my dad said, you know what? If there's nothing else you can do, you know real estate. So why you, not? You know, you we, have this, we have this license. <laughs> yes. Get it up and running again. You know, when, I mean, if you're not when getting a job. When was that year that you literally started the real estate, like your first day? So my first day was 2006, the summer before my university. So it was wow. a while back. I was 16 years old. I'm 34 now. I was 16 years old. What you were selling? Uh, like, we were what the, was my first real estate, Dubai real estate. My that first time. deal, I still remember, when I was 16 years old. The owner of the company, she gave me this key, and she said, "There's an apartment in Dubai Marina." Now, this 2006 Dubai Marina is very different from the Dubai Marina you see right now. There were only the first six towers of Imar Marina, the first six towers, they were ready. And she said, do you know where Dubai Marina is? I said, yeah, yeah, I have a friend that lives in Dubai Marina. She's like, perfect, take this key. This is the apartment number. There's somebody who wants to come and rent it. Just go open the door and I'll do the rest. I went there, I, I, I still remember, I reached the apartment, I opened the door, the gentleman walked in and he's like, okay, nice. I'll take it. I'm like, okay. I said, I don't know what to do next. So I called up my boss and I'm like, uh, boss, you know, the guy said he wants it. 
She's like, really? And I, and I asked the guy, I said, do you really want it? He said, yes, I want it. I'm like, boss, yeah, he said he really wants it. She's like, really? Okay, bring him to the office. And then I'm like, you want to go to the office? He's like, yeah, sure. Next thing you know, we sit in a cab. I go down to the office and the gentleman ends up buying the apartment. You literally had no idea and what I you were doing. no <laughs> idea. And I just thought to myself, I said, wow, this is so easy. Yeah. I said, there's nothing you have to do. Yeah. You have to show up, open a key, let the guy in, let him see the apartment. And that's it. That was, I was extremely wrong. And then the reality <laughs> then I realized hit. reality is struck. <laughs> and then I realized there's a lot of hard work that goes into actually selling real estate. But my first experience was very nice. And uh, I mean, of course, I was working more as an administration, so I didn't really get the full commission for it. But I still remember at that time, I earned 8,000 dirhams. And wow. this was the most money I had ever seen in my life. I'd never seen 8,000 dirhams altogether at once because I'd never got pocket money as much. And we much. need to understand the power of purchase of that dirhams at that time, Of course, right? yeah, yeah, this is 2006. 8,000 dirhams felt more like 30,000 dirhams for today. Exactly. You know, yeah. and uh, for a 16-year-old, that was a lot of money. Exactly, yeah. I still remember I gave 80% of that money to my mother. I said, Mom, my first earning, actually, she was so proud of me. Anyways, the entire summer I worked and then throughout university also, I had the chance to work part-time uh, for another real estate company. So it was good. That was my first sort of initiation. And then right after graduation, my dad said, you know what, go work at a multinational firm, you know, get that experience, polish yourself, polish your skills. You know, you can always rely back on the family business. And uh, you have to remember, I was 20 years old when I graduated from my undergrad. So I was fairly young. Yeah. So my dad wanted me to sort of polish my skills and things like that. So that's why I went around, gave a bunch of interviews, flunked all of them. My dad's like, dude, if you can't do anything, go sit in the restaurant. My dad's like, dude, this son of mine is a, you know, borderline failure. Might as well go and, uh, you know, help me out of the restaurant. And I still remember I was sitting at the counter of the restaurant and taking orders. And I'm like, you know, there's, Ah, you know how restaurants are. There's someone walking in, walking out. It, I mean, you have to be on top of the staff. It's not easy taking care of the staff. And we had a Pakistani restaurant. So, you know, it was more like a cash and carry sort of mm -hmm. a place where average meal price was 20 dirhams. So it wasn't very expensive. So I just did my calculation. I'm like, dude, that's, there's not much money in this. And scalability is a bit of an issue. So that's how then my dad said, you know what? Looks like you can't do anything. So why don't you go into real estate? And I said, sure. That is something I kind of know how to do and I kind of like it. So after my MBA, uh, I went to the US and I came back um, towards the uh, end of, uh, mi middle of 2012. And that's okay. when we restarted Springfield and uh, I sort of took charge um, and we started developing the business. You came back with uh, some uh, skills acquired, right, from the uh, MBA? Yeah, I came back. I, 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 I was lucky enough to go to the U of M, University of Michigan in the United States. Uh, so came back from there and then started off. And uh, literally, when we were a staff of, what I still remember, we were two people, two or three people sitting in a small office in Al-Barsha, Al-Barsha 1. And I still remember it was uh, a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. And then we've grown, grown, grown the team. I still remember my first three, four people are still there with me today, 12 years later. You know, our team has That's grown. That's powerful. You know, we are over 150 people now, you know. Um, yeah. Our overall staff strength in terms of realtors. Yeah, I was about to ask you, like, fast forward uh, to today, yeah. the entire journey. When you look back now, yeah. like, uh, how, yeah. uh, how is the, the Springfield properties look like? Like... Uh, how many employees? Are we are about. Uh, we are a total uh, of 150 people, including our marketing and our uh, sales team as well. Uh, we're based in Business Bay. You know, we're spread over um, an office of about around 10,000 square feet. So we're a fairly large operation. You know, we work with nearly all the major developers in Dubai. So that's our forte, selling under construction and new projects. So we mm -hmm. work with the likes of Emar, Damak, Shoba. Uh, Danube, DR, DP, Miras, all the big major developers big of boys, Dubai. Yeah. yeah, and of course, and we sell for everyone. And then we sell a lot of Ready, which is your secondary market sales as well. And then we have an entire department that does only property management. And I mean, A to Z. I mean, you come to our office and literally from the moment you buy the property to the handover to the property uh, management part of it it's an entire process the entire yeah, process yeah. we take care of it and of course if you have to rent it or sell it or even holiday homes 
If you yeah. want to manage the property on short-term rental basis, we take care of that as well, since we have a lot of international clientele. Farooq, when I look at you, I see exactly <coughs> Dubai. This I can I can literally uh, you know uh, put it into time frame exactly uh, the boat journeys, right? Like how Dubai started from literally from scratch, right? Because they built it from it was just sand at one point, right? Of course. So you are uh, literally a, a Dubai ecosystem product, 100%. 100%. You, your journey, uh, it is hardly attached to the entire Dubai's development, right? Of course. Like you, you put it into time and effort and all your skills, but also you had the chance to, to catch these times, right? Of course, like catch you, the wave of Dubai. Exactly, yeah. Like you, it was exactly at the right point the right time how much weight do you put behind that and how much weight do you put behind the fact that your execution it was different than others of course. to achieve this success i mean hands down you pointed it out very well that we're definitely a byproduct of dubai's success and dubai's leadership and the vision of his highness sheikh mohammed the way he has developed the city um, and we were lucky enough to be you know in an industry that is yes. booming you know, 2010, um, the population of Dubai was, was about one and a half million. Now it's 3.67 million. You know, so it's doubled in the last yes. um, what, 12, 13 years. And of course, when we have doubled the population in this short span of time, it means that we need double the number of houses. So real estate, exactly. luckily, we were in, catering to an industry that was growing so dramatically. We need to highlight this point that in a, in a, at the country level of development, 10 years is literally not that much. Of course, in a very of, uh, short time, it's time very short span period, yeah. where you're talking about doubling yeah. of our population. In 10 I mean, years, that is that's a, that huge is a impact, strong, yeah. strong uh, percentage of growth. Yes. And with the number of people, I mean, I've seen the city develop from the little uh, parts of Dera and Bur Dubai it used to be when I was growing up in Dubai, you know, in the 90s. Uh, trade center was the end of Dubai. And then you had a few villas in Jumeirah, and then you had some few hotels on the beach, and this was all a desert. And downtown, as we see it today, where you have the Burj Khalifa and Dubai Mall and all of these beautiful towers, was a military camp yes. up until early 2000s. So you would, we're talking hardly 20 years ago. You know, this was all a military camp. This was all a desert. So the way they have grown, you know, I still remember as a kid, I always used to ask my dad, when will this construction end? Because there's always construction around our area. And my dad's like, you know, soon. And <laughs> fast forward 30 years later, I'm still asking, yeah. <laughs> you know, this construction. Yeah. Uh, now I hope that it never ends, obviously, being in the real estate business. But I definitely have to give equal weightage to the development of Dubai. I don't think we would have done as well as a company if it was any other city in the world. You know, yes, the growth of the city is, the... is I uh, definitely half of the credit goes to Dubai. It goes to the fact that we were lucky enough to be in a city which was developing at this rapid pace and which is continuing to develop at yeah. this rapid uh, place. It's a, it's a lot of competition in real estate as well. Obviously. I want to ask you a thing. When it was like, uh, you have seen a lot, right? Since you, you started your journey. It was harder to sell Dubai at that time or now when you literally have, let's say um, a new project uh, is coming, right? Yeah. But now the way how they build it with endless facilities, uh, roads in place, uh, you know, all these amenities uh, uh, accessible at, uh, like this, right? Is it way easier now or it was easier at that time when actually people were fascinating about Dubai or what was your selling point at that time to sell Dubai? So I think the first time I entered into the market was 2006. Up until 2008, the market was booming just how it is today. You know, it was at a very rapid pace. So it was relatively easy then, but I wasn't really into the market full on. I think 2010 to 14, it was a bit of a challenge. Today is a lot easier than, you know, this time between 2010 up until 2020, this 10 year period. I think selling Dubai today is a lot easier because of the kind of marketing Dubai is doing. Everyone that is coming to Dubai, you know, they know that the market is doing really well. Between 2010 to 2020, it was still a little bit harder. I think uh, Dubai didn't have the 
marketing. I mean, it, Dubai has always been marketing itself, but the way it's marketing itself now, yeah, I think it's 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 light years ahead of ten uh, years ago. So it's definitely I personally think it's become a lot more easier. The, the real challenge now is getting uh, inventory from developers because mm-hmm. developments come and they sell out so quickly, especially the good developers and the mm-hmm. big developments. It's hard to get good properties. Previously, it was hard to get customers. Now it's fairly easier to get customers. It's harder to get the product. So because of the demand. Do you think it's a matter of uh, people having more money now, nowadays? Uh, like more capital available I think in du- general? See, Dubai is attracting people from all around the world. So it's not just one market. It's not just our local market. You know, we we see a lot of foreign investment coming to Dubai. Yeah, I'm talking globally. Like yeah. in general, we have more money. We can generate more money than at least we were able to do it 10, 15 years ago, right? Yeah. Now we are more skillful. We acquire more. Of course. There are more opportunities. And this one is like end result of having more uh, financial benefits at the end. No, no, you're right. I think that's the reason why Dubai is now catering a lot more to that higher segment in the market as well. Mm. Previously, we had never heard of transactions, you know, like the what we hear today, 100 million plus, 200 million dirham plus. You know, there was a villa, villa sold in the Palm, 250 million plus. We've seen some properties sold in Marsal, Dubai. For 300 million, we saw a penthouse being sold in Palm Jumeirah this uh, last year for 500 million dirhams. A penthouse. Tell so, me your tell me your best shot. What was the? Best I mean, deal? we've had transactions done in our office um, over 150 million. Uh, even we've done bulk transactions for entire buildings as well. That's so your those company. Are, but I want to I want you to tell me yours, like the one you. You, I was you, involved. you took the customer in, in the entire journey. You you generate the yeah. first call and then you... you so. so I think my biggest transactions yes. that I did were not from the moment of inception where I made the first call. Obviously, with a bigger staff strength now, I'm generally the one assisting when the big client comes in. Okay. So uh, my biggest transaction, I think, was close to 200 million, which was something that I really worked hard on with the client direct touch with the client and took him through the journey of finding the property, finding the uh, development and then finally investing into it. I want you to tell me more about that without uh, mentioning names or something, but I'm curious, what does it take in terms of preparation when you literally have that feeling, you smell the blood, right? Like, okay, like it's 200 million deal on the table for for me as a as a Employee of the company at the yeah. end, right? Because even if you're running the company, you, if you're a seller, of course, if you're a realtor, you can uh, uh, consider yourself as a as a salesperson, right? Of course, of course. And if you don't smell the blood, and yeah, if you don't exactly. feel like, excited, you don't feel that rush. What do you do day one? Like, how do you prepare your first touch with the customer? How do you introduce yourself? How which kind of things you you, know, you mention first? You know. See, for me personally, I think now. Uh, the introducing part and things have become a little bit more easier and that's I think the reason why you know I personally do a lot of marketing uh, not just for the company but I've invested in my own brand as well or, you know, on Instagram on social media and things sense. like that so that definitely helped and of course having a fairly decent good large setup in Dubai definitely helps in you know uh, putting that image across uh, when it comes to being a realtor and uh, I think a lot goes into preparation because when you're dealing with such a sophisticated client, you know, you need to know each and every little nitty gritty detail of the area, the developer, the development. And then you have to compare with other options as well. You know, so finding the right option, comparing it, giving him market research, data analysis, because you have to remember the higher you go up in terms of the food chain of clients, let's say, the more sophisticated they become. Yes. You know, the more ideas they have, the more, I mean, the more money they have, the more options they have. You mm-hmm. know, the world is their playground. When you're going above the 50 million dirham range, people are comparing not just areas, but they're even comparing cities. So why should I invest in Dubai? Why not take this money and invest it in, mm-hmm. I don't know, London or New York or 
uh, China, for example. Yeah. So you have to have a lot more sophisticated conversations with clients, have data to back up whatever claims that you're doing in terms of this is the property that I believe you should buy. This is our future forecasts. This is what the data is pointing towards. We believe the growth is such and such. The historical data is showing this and why we believe this is the data and then going more deep into it. Like this is the area, this building is located here. For me, I've always believed, you know, in the rental and the capital appreciation that Dubai has to offer. So building a model, your next five years, 10 years projection that you will get as a return on that property. Yeah, you know, so you have to have all the wise all the wise place. answered yeah. before, you know, you, you mentioned preparation. How do you yeah. prepare? You have to prepare a lot. I think that's the yeah. golden nugget, you know, out of all of this. When you're going for these bigger clients, you have to prepare. The more you study, the more you learn, you know, as a, you know, as a CEO of the company, I always tell my team, it's all about training. Yes. You know, you can't be a realtor and just, you know, start making videos. And of course, you might start getting clients. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you will only close the deals once you're able to execute of course you know a transaction only when you are able to give that information you're able to come across as an expert in your field you know the people who are coming to dubai you know they're very sophisticated buyers they're coming with big budgets exactly so they have they have a uh, you know uh, a lot of agents to deal with it's it's now i'm going to the next question when you sell this kind of properties, right? Like when you mentioned like uh, 50 million plus, right? In this luxury world, you have to become like super knowledgeable in what does luxury mean, right? Of course. Because your customers, for example, your client, maybe his passion is about cigars or maybe his passion is about watches of or course. yachts or, you know, this kind of luxury world. So you need to be ready somehow to handle, to entertain the discussion at this level before you touch the property itself, yeah, right? Yeah. How it's, important is that for you? How do you train your stuff? With I that? always say building rapport is very important. When you're sitting across the table from a client, you should start off by coming across as likable because people do business with people that they like. You know, until unless you don't like the salesperson that you're dealing with, especially when it comes to such, you know, big ticket sales. Exactly. You have to come across as a very likable person. Like you said, the guy could be to watches. You have to find some sort of similarities. You know, they always say people buy from people they like and people like people who are more like themselves. Yeah. You know, so you you like people with shared interests. So like I like, like you said, rich people like watches, yachts, cars, holidays at the south, uh, you know, in the south of France, you know. So you should be able to sit across the table, entertain them, like you said, entertain them, be at that level as well. Okay, you might not be at the guy who can afford to buy a 200 million dirhams property, but you should be able to entertain somebody or at least have mm -hmm. a good conversation with that per, uh, person and build that sort of relationship where he feels that, you know, this is the kind of person I like and I would like to close my transaction with him. So building rapport, coming across as likable, being at their level, you know, while having a conversation or at least being able to hold up a conversation is very important. So in our trainings, we always tell our agents, go for the boat show, go for the air show, you know, go for this Dubai Watch Week, you know, it's a great yes. place for you to just kind of learn about these things. You know, you might not be ready to buy uh, a half a million there on Patek Philippe, or you might not be ready to buy a few million dollar worth of a Richard meal, but at least knowing about those watches, knowing about, like you said, you know, the different kinds of yachts that they have today in the morning, I was actually in a yacht, uh, BMW's released this new yacht. I don't know if you saw it on my Instagram story, BMW's released this new yacht. It's called the Icon. And in the morning today, I was there yeah. with the uh, founder of the company that is manufacturing the yacht. And he said, Father, let me take you for a spin in my yacht. I said, sure. I said, what kind of yacht is it? He's like, let me show you. And I said, okay, let's see. So it's a yacht that hovers above the ground by 90 centimeters. So while you're sitting in the yacht, you know, you feel no movement of the waves. Yeah. So it's a silent yacht. He showed me his glass of water. He left it over there on the yacht. He said, see, far the water's not moving. And we're going at... I don't know how many knots at a very fast speed. So, yeah. uh, you know, learning about these things because he's so excited about his yacht. 
you know. It's another dot of uh, we can connect the conversation, right? Of Before course. you're selling. Yeah, so yeah. I always tell my sales people that learn about these different things, uh, educate yourself. You know, these are things not necessarily you learn at school, but as a salesperson, you should be able to hold up a conversation. Learn yeah. your product, come across as likable, be able to connect with people, and yeah. it's a great place to network with people as well. When you go for these events, you go for these, you know, watch week, boat shows, car shows, it's a great place to meet people as well. It's a very sophisticated business because when you when you deal with people at this level, I think I'm not uh, I'm not in the real estate business, but uh, obviously we are interconnected uh, markets. Uh, yeah. A lot of crypto guys uh, yeah. buying real estate now. So in my perspective, the way how I see it, when you say luxury, is is definitely a game where you have to uh, be able to, for example, there is this watch industry, right? A lot of products are super limited unaccessible or like very rare pieces right if you manage to to put your clients in, in with his hands on that watch right yeah. a very rare piece of yeah. because you have built a great relationship with Patek Philippe director right yeah. Yeah. and then you have access to this world in a different way yeah that customer will be yours like For sure. forever yeah yeah 100% yeah this you know. is another way to position yourself and I, I, I have a friend to, that to do, to make business with you. Yeah, I, you know, I have a few friends who have very good profiles with Emmett Siddiqui and Sons. You know, who's the dealership yeah. for all the big watch brands, and uh, literally, he's like, Farouk, anytime you want, uh, you know, I'll I'll get this watch and that watch." But I was thinking Skip the same the thing. Queue. I said, "You know, if you have that kind of a thing to offer your client, you know, that that client, like you said, will remember you. He'll be like, you know what, this guy is useful. You know, so you have to come across as a useful, likable." And of course, knowledgeable person, especially when it comes to real estate. How is this part when you you get the yes? Okay, I'm I'm okay sold like yeah. at the property moment, right? Yeah. When you say okay, one, two, three, actually you sell the property, and then he's not calling you back or he's keep you know he's keeping you under your toes. Like how do you deal with that? Do you go back and? Uh, have another approach, uh, like a uh, follow-up or something, or you just stay Let out there. Uh, but in the same time, maybe someone else will come to in the picture, right? Like, how do you manage that? See, rejection is a big part of sales. There is a lot of rejection when it comes to sales, but you have to have a thick skin in real estate. But the most important step in this entire sales process is follow-up. You know, there was a study by uh, the U.S. Realtors Association, which said that uh, 80% of real estate agents do not follow up after the second call. They call once, they call second, the client doesn't call back, they, do, they say it's done. And 80% of sales, so 80% of agents never go beyond the second follow-up, and 80% of sales happen on the sixth follow-up. This was a study done. <laughs> So it means that only Incredible. 20% of the agents are actually reaching that level where they actually reach the fifth and sixth follow-up. So I personally believe that you have to follow up till you know, the customer doesn't come across and says, you know what, Farooq, I've decided not to buy real estate. Yes. So follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. Follow up is the name of the game. Once again, there's an art of following up. You don't have to come across as you know, uh, too pushy. If the client isn't calling back, it could be potentially the fact that he's very busy. Generally, in real estate, we only deal with successful, rich individuals. You know, someone buying a 5 million, 10 million, 20 million dirham house yeah. is fairly successful. He's either a businessman or he's a top level executive. So he's busy. You know, most people are very busy. So understanding that they're running on a busy schedule as well. But sometimes people even like the fact that you followed a few, a few times, especially if they've not outward said, no, I'm not interested in buying. Yes. So you have to follow up a few times. And like I said, at least six, seven times you have to follow up before, as per studies, is that's the time when you actually end up closing the deal. So following up is extremely important. We still have to follow up, even if they're big people. And I always tell my agents as well, sometimes the client needs us to follow up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, I get a call. I'm in a, I'm sitting in a podcast right now. I might get three calls. 
I might not be able to call up, call back everyone. But if somebody makes another effort and calls you back tomorrow and says, you know what, Farooq, I called you around 5.30 p.m. I understand you were busy, but I thought I'd catch you at a better time. I will appreciate that because I'm going to think five times before I end up calling all these four people again. And I will think, you know what, if someone's really urgent, he'll either text me or he'll call me back. I'm a marketer. In my experience of sales is the rejection is either not in this way or not now. Either you come with a better offer yeah. or you, you just shape out the offer in a in different uh, uh, manner or just it's not the right moment for me right now. Like let's talk in two months. Whatever. Two months, yeah. yeah. And, and, and like you said, if the client is responding back but it's just not pulling the trigger and is not making the purchase, then I like to sit down and have a frank conversation like, hey, Danny, we're both working here to find something that you like. I've showed you a few things. Give me your feedback. Tell me. They always said, God gave you two ears to listen and one mouth to speak. <laughs> so let me listen to what you need to, yeah. rather than me just pitching, 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 giving you all the options, talking about the market, talking about why this property is the best property in the world. But let me listen to what your requirement is. I feel like when you, as a salesperson, it's very important to listen and understand because you might give me things like, you know what, like you said, like either not right now or... Why not right now? Is there some particular reason? Then you might tell me, you know what, I'm selling a property and I'm going to get some money and this money, it might take time to transfer to Dubai. So I need this much time. And then we can maybe work out a solution. If you like this yeah. option I've showed you, maybe we can, I don't know, increase the size of the contract or we can increase the duration or you pay a smaller deposit now and then we uh, mature the uh, transaction. If there's something that we can do to kind of fit the transaction, especially if you like the property, you'll find a solution. When you have this kind of deals at this scale, like 50 million plus 100 million, 200 yeah. million, what do you think is your unique selling proposition for that client? What was uh, the most important thing for them? Because it obviously it's not, a, it's not a financial objective, right? When they buy a property, they look for different things as a wise, right? Personally, what do you think is that? particular thing that okay if i solve this yeah sold personally i think when it comes to buying a home so when you're selling a, a home to someone which is 50 to 100 million the 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 objective is very different whereas when if you're selling an entire asset like i've sold an entire asset which is a building which gives return for yes. those investors it's different objective for the of course for the buyer it's something i like my wife likes my kids like this will make me happy Sometimes it's not just about the price, even if, you know, it's something beyond what they believe is the correct market price, they might just end up buying it because there is no price on what you like. So people might just yes, say, you know, exactly. it's unique architecture, it's a unique build, it's a very unique location, and they so might you, just end up putting the trigger. You don't have to go in figures with them. You need to not go the, in different aspects. Yeah. So for a home buyer, yeah. it's more about what they like. So I mean, I mean, the guy who has, you have to understand what's going on in the client's mind. When you have that sort of money that you could spend 50 to 100 million on a home, you know, it means you are someone pretty substantially well off. So money is not sometimes always an objective. You exactly. know, it's more yeah. about what I like. I'm going to spend time over here. My family is going to stay here. Is it something that they like? So sometimes they could, even if the numbers don't always make 100% sense, they might actually uh, end up pulling the trigger. However, when it's an investment product, if they're buying a building for rental returns, then it's more about the numbers. It's and it's pure more about figures. pure figures, future yes. projection, exit strategy. Show me my money. Show me the money. I'm going to buy this yes. for 200 million. Am I going to make 300 in a year or two years? Or what's the timeline? What's the return I have? I'm putting cash. What am I getting in return? That's it. So it, it differs for those that Which are more. Which one is easier? Number, oh, definitely. If you're selling a home, it might take longer yeah. because finding the right client that would walk in the doors and say, aha, this is what I'm looking for, might take time. But the transactions are generally much faster. So I've sold penthouses in a day, literally. Client came in, liked it, said, damn, this is exactly what I was looking for. You know, this will be a great penthouse for me and my family. And boom, think... I closed the deal in a day. For buildings, it's taken me months and months and months <laughs> of going back and forth, sending projections, showing different options, 
you know, deciding on how to negotiate, then the seller and buyer, both of them getting them bridging the gap of their offers. Yeah. All of this takes time. So it's a lot easier when you're dealing with an individual who's deciding from the heart, you know, other than an investor who's deciding with his brain and numbers. Let me call my accountant. Let me call let my me accountant, call. let me call my banker. Yeah. Let me get my, uh, yeah. I don't know, board of directors to approve this. The more people are get, involved in the, in the deal, more yeah the more traction the more, more elements exactly more, the know, more duration our yes. time it takes to exactly. mature when we sell for example the to the home guy right big properties yeah because i want to stay here in this luxury yeah. part this is the the i mean like uh, what attracts you yeah in in terms of um, my new buyer how do you access soon. their brain like how do you actually sell them because people i want to understand how do you how do you interfere with that self conversation the customer have pre or purchase right because yeah. this is the the main job of a salesperson if you can just access that the stage of conversation of your customer yeah. like he has internally right and plant the seed yeah. exactly there like why you should buy it yeah. and i think for the properties, high valuable properties, they are buying these properties based on who they are. Yeah. It's not based on like a, how much is it, or it's just a matter of is this property is like a like a mirroring my personality, yeah. right? Is is this uh, it's a status these symbol. elements in place? For sure. I mean, for the guy who's worth and has that affordability, for a lot of them, it's a status symbol. You know, you want to live in a particular area. Um, like you said, that there's something in their brain that says, I need to be around these kind of people as mm -hmm. well. So, you know, I've just remembering when you're talking about that, what are the different buyers? So I've dealt with some uh, movie stars that I yes. recently sold something to. So accessing them is nearly impossible, getting to them. But luckily they came to me. And they said, you know, we've seen your work. We've seen the fact that you deal in a lot of luxury real estate. And this is what we want. I mean, if you have a Dubai. celebrity in your building, is like having, uh, you know, the Joker, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like if I'm going to tell you, NJ Lowe is at the seventh floor. Yeah. Like, how sure. is that? <laughs> the other neighbors, Sold, yeah? <laughs> the, the, the other neighbors might end up buying or yes. increasing the value of their properties. Yeah. But the requirement for them is different. You know, they already have that celebrity status, but for them, it's more about privacy. It's mm -hmm. more about convenience coming in, out. It's a lot about security. It's a lot about being closer to the entertainment areas, being close to, you know, I sold something to somebody in the Royal Atlantis, uh, Atlantis the Royal, sorry. You know, for them, it was more about being somewhere where I can come in and out, enjoy while I'm here, don't really need to drive out. I have lots of dining options. Mm -hmm. I get everything on a phone call. You know, then I've had some, Celebrities Comfort. end up buying in, I don't know, the one palm where they don't want to be next to a hotel property. They don't want to be somewhere where other people can access the property. You know, then I've had, um, you know, super uh, wealthy tech entrepreneurs you know, that have just, they want to hide away in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And we ended up selling them things like in Dubai Hills, you know, where it's more about a community. When I come to Dubai, I want the space, I want the garden, I want the you know, privacy, I have the money, but it's more about me enjoying the interiors of my house. So yes. for everyone, it's a different requirement. And if you can tap and understand into what that requirement is, and you're able to find and tailor a product that fits into that requirement of that person, I'm sure you'll be able to close the deal. And of course, like you said, they want to, you know, have a reflection of their personality. Of you know? course. So. What is the profile uh, of the crypto guy? The guy who is cashing out yeah. his uh, investments and he's reaching out, hey, I want a property. Are these guys like uh, so, so I've actually selling dealt, them fast or like... So I've actually dealt with a few crypto guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't understand uh, in the beginning whether they were actually wealthy enough. 
uh, to buy these properties that they came and started talking about. So, I, so I mean, in Dubai, we we deal with a lot of, especially in the luxury segment. You know, we have a lot of people walking through the door who are more what I call window shoppers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first thing is, you know, we try to see whether this guy. I mean, unless they're well known and unless they're coming through a reference. Legit confirmed. Legit confirmed. Yes. So, a lot of crypto guys that I ended up end up meeting, half of them sometimes are not legit. But we've met some really legit crypto guys as well. And they've been very quick deals for me because the amount of money that they're making in their own business yeah. um, is quite high. You know, so for them, it's more about something that they like and they want to, you know, have a lateral store of investment. They don't want to put all their eggs in one basket and they want to cash out something. They understand real estate is not a overnight increase in value, but yeah. it's something that in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it is a a solid asset class that is not going to go anywhere. And all these crypto guys that I've noticed, they're always going for more prime real estate. So properties in downtown, Palm, you know, they want to buy that luxury segment, especially the big guys in crypto. They're buying a lot in Dubai just so that they can hedge their um, downside, God forbid, if there ever is a downside in crypto. Yeah, of course. There's uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, like uh, a lot of people from crypto they are coming in the real estate just to, as you mentioned, to edge their, uh, their uh, investments or to have a kind of uh, diversity of portfolio, right? Yeah. You have some in, in uh, such a volatile market, of but then you put something in the real estate. But I want you to understand, like, how do you deal with them? Like, uh, do you treat them like uh, easy money or uh, how do you see them as like as profile? Yeah. I don't think I treat anyone differently. You know, if you're a customer for me, you know, or, or, or if you're a customer for real estate, you know, I would treat everyone with, uh, you know, utmost respect. And obviously, you know, uh, depends on whatever their requirement is. You know, our process in sales is very similar. Understand the client requirements, show them um, the right options, mm -hmm. a few options, not um, the market's huge. And then try to find something that fits that requirement. And but I do, do you accept crypto payments? In Dubai, we have third party that accepts the crypto and then helps us to pay the developers. For example, if you're buying something from a major developer, okay. there are a few developers that are open to accepting crypto as well. You know, I'm assuming Bitcoin only or like... Bitcoin only. Bitcoin only. Bitcoin yeah. only. So they will not deal in altcoins. But what they'll do is they'll tell you or you either convert it to USDT and then they'll accept either Bitcoin or USDT. And then we have third party companies that will help us cash out the Bitcoin and then pay to the developers. So yeah. we have all sorts of um, assistance when it comes to these things. But yeah, we're seeing a lot more people coming to Dubai in the last few years. You know, crypto millionaires from Europe, um, India, a lot of them are now choosing to come to Dubai because it's a lifestyle, you know. They have money, they want to enjoy, they want to be safe. You know, uh, in Dubai, you could be the ex-president of a country and you could be walking in Dubai Mall. And it's uh, easy. You know, I, just before coming over here, I, I, uh, something popped up on my Instagram. There was Mukesh Ambani's son walking around in Dubai Mall. You know, very regularly is what the richest, one of the richest uh, kids in the world. You know, uh, just walking in Dubai Mall with one security guy and he's just walking around shopping in Dubai Mall. So that's the kind of uh, life you can enjoy being the who's who of the world in Dubai. So that's, I think, what attracts a lot of them to Dubai. Do you have on your roadmap as a company, as a CEO of uh, Springfield Properties, is it in your roadmap of business development at one point to accept directly Bitcoin so for your as, properties? So as an agency... I, actually, the question is, yeah. do you see value in this uh, in these things? Or there's, how there's, do you position There's yourself? definitely a lot of value. However, it's not our decision as an agency. So as a real estate agency, we're not allowed to accept payment into our company at all. Let it be cash or crypto because of the UAE's regulations of course, yes. on our business. Yes. So we are a very regulated company and any money that comes in is taxable. So technically, we are not the ones that are either going to accept crypto in the future yeah. or not. It's more about the developers, whether they will accept crypto. And I think okay. with some of the uh, you know volatility in the market, developers also need to pay suppliers ahead. So there is a certain, you know, kind of market dynamics because 
still crypto is not readily acceptable by every vendor developers yes. cannot accept cash so i cannot accept crypto so i can't it's be not a, a legal tender yet yeah yeah so yeah. till that till that doesn't happen i don't think you'll see developers readily selling properties in crypto mm-hmm. i think it will be more about sure you're a crypto guy you can cash out pay in usdt and we'll assist you through that process so most developers will will market that they're accepting crypto but in reality they're dealing with third party companies yeah it's a back end that but there's it's a back end that converts to fiat converts to fiat yeah. currency as a personal level have you invested i have but very less compared to my other investments mm. so as an individual i like to play around you know sometimes i have friends who are deep into crypto so they keep telling me faru what are you doing i still remember the <laughs> conversation i had with one of my friends i don't know at that time i, th- I think the price of one bitcoin was i think 15000 or something so he comes up to me like faru you haven't bought brit bitcoin i said yeah and i still remember my son was you see he's still fairly young but he was you know just less uh, a year or two old and he comes up to me he's like faru one day when your son grows up he's going to tell you dad Bitcoin was at fifteen thousand dollars, and you didn't buy it. Today, it's at millions of dollars. What the hell did you do? You made such a big mistake. And I think I got really emotional that day, and I said, <laughs> "Really? I'm like, shit! I need to go buy myself some crypto." <laughs> and I still remember I went and I told my friend, "You know what? Set up my crypto.com wallet and everything." And then I set it up, and then I bought of, uh, I invested a little bit into crypto. But I've not really deep dived into different altcoins or anything. But I've, yes, I've bought Bitcoin. I bought Ethereum. I've bought and I've kept it in my wallet, but not actively trading it. I feel like you know, real estate is my thing. I understand this. You know, we yeah. see the opportunities before others. So why not invest in something that um, you understand? So for that reason, I think you know, I've not deep dived into crypto and kept most of my holdings in real estate. To me, this is another confirmation that successful people they focus on one thing only. Yeah. Okay, you might touch some other things, but just for fun with yeah. zero expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you maybe you saw something based on your friend stories, yeah. successful stories, yeah. but your thing you're doing. What I'm doing, I'm doing right. I'm doing good. I'm doing I good. I sleep well at Let's night. Do exactly, exactly. <laughs> I don't need to worry about oh my god, what's happening to this? What's happening to that? in bitcoin or sorry in crypto uh no doubt people have made million billions you know but also it's a it's also a there's a reverse part there's a flip the side to that story yes. you know uh, there's a lot that have lost uh, a lot you know so like you said you stick need to, to what have you know hard uh, yeah. uh, how we say you need to have um, uh, a cold heart cold heart a cold solid heart, heart a solid you cold that, heart <laughs> that, in crypto there's going to be a lot of ups and downs today you you can dance with uh, 2 3 x and tomorrow you can have 90% down yeah yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. you need to be prepared there mentally a, not only like financially yeah. but uh, we've seen so many mm, things uh, there, happening there around. was a time a few years back when there was a lot of talk about crypto so a friend of mine one of my other friends he said you know what pay a small amount of money and let let me end up buying and we were all friends sitting and all of us i think we put in some money equally six seven of us a very close friend and one of my other friends he was managing he was buying shiba inu i think that was a coin that went up like crazy yeah. so we got so excited it was similar i think it went up i think it was 10x yeah so i think if whatever 100 uh, we put it became a thousand and we were like wow like this is crazy you know and then yeah. we went invested more and then all of a sudden <laughs> we ended up losing everything so i said okay this is too much stress for me yeah. i can do this Well this is the industry has its own journey attached but uh, in a back end it's a very solid industry of course. with uh, if you asking me because we are in this industry we are of building course. here obviously we believe so much in it and uh, we know the the implications behind and it. fundamentals it has a huge impact in our uh, lives people will see maybe in five years maybe in 10 years but the implications and uh, actually the 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 utility and the impact that so many problems will be solved just by by the blockchain uh, it will be it's it's such a necessary thing to happen in of our course. lives it it is natural step and all those applications all those like it was offline online on chain yeah. this is the the natural way of 
the society development. This is going to be all the applications will be on chain. Yeah. Like how you see now, there is no such a company without website, right? Yeah. You can't exist. Of this course. is a paradox. But yeah. if you don't exist virtually, actually you, you, you can't exist yeah, in reality. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is the thing right now with yeah. online, offline. Yeah. This will come with on chain as well. Like it will be way easier, way faster. Everything is a totally different scale. But it takes time, of, yeah, course. of course. Like any like any industry, I think uh, crypto definitely is, it's the future. There's no denying the future. Everything, mm -hmm. like you said, is going to be virtually. I think the invent of artificial intelligence, like you said, every company is going to be uh, relying on this much more heavily. So it's definitely a very interesting industry. How do you see artificial intelligence? Like, because <clears throat> another big one, right? And we don't have the right amount of time now to cover <laughs> AI, but I'm sure that somehow you you might think about it, right? Because you can incorporate it as a customer service, as a, even as a... So uh, many, so, so many, many, so many uses. Yeah. In real estate in particular, the prop tech, which is property technology, is really getting affected by artificial intelligence on... As an MBA holder, do you, do you, are you planning to, to incorporate uh, any sort of AI technology in we your business? We are actually implementing uh, artificial intelligence at different stages. Um, for example, our chatbot on the websites are powered by AI now, you know, where, uh, I mean, it's, it's actually quite freaky as to how good a conversation those chatbots can do. Of you know, they can take you throughout the entire journey, the customer journey, and it's always learning and it's always adapting and it's always improving its answers. You know, of course, you still need a human touch at the end of the day. But of course, I mean, even simple tools like ChatGPT, you know, it's we're, we use it all the time. I use it all the time. You know, I mean, it's super easy to use, you know, when we're writing letters or, you know, even in, I mean, we do a lot of marketing. So in, when it comes to real estate, real estate yeah, as an agency, you have to do a lot of marketing. Absolutely. So we're using so many AI tools now to do things like video editing, to do things like picture editing, to do... Uh, so many, there's so many, so many applications within the real estate field that we are as Springfield using, you know, being always fascinated by technology myself. I've always tried to push forward, even our CRM system that we use, you know, we are trying to implement AI into, for example, a simple thing, making sure that all our past clients and leads you know, are being touched upon again. <laughs> so using AI, uh, generating tools to, you know, communicate with them because at the end of the day, we are talking to, th we're generating thousands and thousands of leads Volume, yes. every month. I Not mean, to mention the virtual tour, right? There this is, is so, so much, powerful. Like, you know. Uh, just put your headsets, go in the kitchen, go in the balcony. Especially for us as a company. Take the feeling of your property right we, now. We sell a lot of under construction real estate. So there's no physical apartment to take exactly. them so like what you said you wear your meta glasses and then you can do your 360 tours you know and there's a lot of developers now that are implementing See those your property VR tours. in dubai but you actually sitting swim in with dolphin in puerto rico <laughs> exactly so <Sold. laughs> it definitely has a lot of and i think dubai as a city always keeps technology on the forefront and i think we're going to keep uh seeing it uh being implemented a lot more in real estate absolutely it's it's that's what i'm saying like those kind of technologies, blockchain with AI, artificial intelligence, metaverse even, yeah. right? This is the natural step of, of mankind. Yeah. Like it, we are going in this direction. It's not up to you if it's coming or not, but it's up to you if you adapt or not. Of course. If, you're, if you don't see it, in my, in my perspective, you'll just be out of the Left market. behind. Yeah. Any business, I think, if you don't adapt, um, you're going to be lo you're going to be left out. We've seen so many people in my industry, for example, in real estate, older companies, behemoths of their time. You know, they just vanished because they didn't adapt. You know, I always remember the story of Blockbuster in the U.S., biggest, you know, movie rental uh, company. They didn't move into, uh, you know, the OTT, and then we had players like Netflix come, and in few years. Blockbuster went out of business because they didn't adapt. So I always remember that story and I always think, man, if such behemoths can be taken down, you know, who are we? How do you see real estate in, in uh, Dubai 2060? Population of Dubai is going to be 
maybe by 2060, three times of what it is today. Dubai will become one of the largest inhabited cities in the world. I think by 2060, all of this belt around uh, the sea, you know, it'll be completely, I mean, I mean, there won't be an inch. I mean, there already hardly is any space close to the beach, but all of this area will be completely full and we'll be moving more towards Dubai South and those areas. And I think being a world-class city with world-class leaders, we will continue to develop our infrastructure, our connectivity in terms of metro. Dubai will be a lot more green as it is as compared to today. We'll see a lot less desert. We'll see a lot more greenery. Mm. Their urban plan is such to make Dubai a green oasis in the world. You know, so it will become one of the largest cities. Like I said, I expect the population by 2060 to be close to 10 million people. It is going to be a global connected capital of the world, if not not just the Middle East, of yeah. the world. You know, we have people from all over the world that will be here. Their model has been tried and tested and it works. It will be a financial capital. It will be a real estate hub. It will be uh, a sports entertainment capital of the world. Beautiful. And I think we, we are not going only horizontally, but we are going to move a little bit up the course. environment, right? Of course. Like air taxi companies now is already coming. You know, we're going to have, we're going to have the, uh, uh, what's that um, uh, tunnel system that, uh, you know, you know, you, know you, you develop the tunnel system like 100 meters, 200 meters below ground. Your Elon Musk is developing that system. I think Dubai will have that. We'll have the air taxis. We're going to have, we're going to continue to always have the tallest towers in the world. So if someone tries to overtake Burj Khalifa, I'm sure Dubai will come up with another tower, Absolutely. which will be even taller. So we'll have the biggest and the best because I feel like this vision of Sheikh Mohammed has been become embedded into the city. For me as well, my mentor is Sheikh Mohammed. You know, I've read his, I've Beautiful. read all his books. I've read you know, I've been a big fan of his management technique, how he's developed Dubai as a company. You know, it's literally being run like a business. It's absolutely. Dubai is, Dubai There's is, no other way. They say you, Dubai Incorporated is like yeah. the Sheikh CEO. Yeah. You know, how yes. he handles every department. You know, uh, we are on the right hands. You know, exactly. And, I, and, <laughs> I, and, I, and I'm a strong believer of Sheikh Hamdan and the next generation to come yes, as well of indeed. leaders. Yes. And they're developing their future very well. So I'm very positive and I'm, I, I feel we're all lucky and blessed to be in the city. Absolutely. Farouk, thank you very much for coming today to ICN Talks. I want to see you selling the most valuable properties in Dubai, thank you the so highest much. floors. Thank you the so much. The taller buildings, everything, Thank you. <laughs> top, top, top. <laughs> Thank uh, you so keep much, building in the, in the ecosystem because uh, uh, obviously we need real builders like you. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks again for coming. And It was my pleasure. Uh, it was an honor. And I wish you a lot of success. And uh, hopefully we continue to grow together with the city of Dubai. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are on the table here also to build great things. And please mention where people can find you. So you can follow me on my Instagram account, which is at Farouk, F-A-R-O-O-Q underscore S-Y-D uh, on my Instagram uh, and Farouk Sayed on YouTube. Uh, so I'm quite active on my YouTube channel as well. And then, of course, I'm on LinkedIn, TikTok. You can follow me on any of those. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching. And uh, don't forget to smash the like button. Please drop us a comment how you like it. Please follow us on uh, Iron Capital News across uh, major platforms and uh, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next one. Thank you.